The Gilded Age is an American series created and written by Julian Fellows for HBO. This is my costume review of Season 2. If you're new to my channel, I did a Season 1 review and a more recent interview with custom costume creator Eric Winterling, who created many of the women's costumes in Seasons 1 and 2. I'll leave a link to the videos in the pinned comment in case you want to check them out. Before we get to the review, there will be spoilers for all of Season 2 of The Gilded Age, and I've added bookmarks so you can always jump ahead to your favorite character. The costumes were brought to the small screen by series costume designer Kasha Wilike Maimone. In 2023, she earned a Costume Designer Guild Award nomination for excellence in period television with the Season 1 episode Let the Tournament Begin, Losing Out to the Crown. More recently, she and associate costume designer Patrick Wiley received a 2024 Costume Designer Guild Award nomination for their work on the Season 2 episode, You Don't Even Like Opera. In this video, I showcase a collection of behind-the-scenes pictures, mood boards, fabric swatches, and costume design sketches primarily sourced from Kasha Wailike Maimone's Instagram page. In addition to her contributions, I comb through the Instagram pages of the main cast to unearth additional pics. And I want to express my gratitude for the growing trend among designers who willingly share their creative processes on their social media accounts. Additionally, I gained insights into the historical inspirations behind many of the gowns from the Instagram accounts of the Corseted Beauty and Period Corset. For those interested, I've included links for you in the description below if you want to check them out. In summary, I thoroughly enjoyed Season 2 of The Gilded Age as it provided the perfect escapism. During my live streams, I mentioned that the story seemed a bit slow in the beginning, but it really picked up by mid-season. Surprisingly, even the initially slow-paced storyline about Jack Trotter's clock turned out to be quite riveting. While the major plot revolved around the opera wars throughout the season, what truly caught my attention was the dynasty-style rivalry between Bertha Russell and Enid Winterton, Bertha's former lady's maid. It added a touch of fun. The Peggy Scott storyline was also engaging, but just like in season one, I was captivated by the acerbic-witted Agnes Van Rijn, flawlessly portrayed by Christine Baranski. And certainly, a costume drama like The Gilded Age wouldn't be complete without fabulous costumes. In season two, set in the spring of 1883, I felt that the design team made and fitted during a global pandemic. Despite what I perceive as some flaws, and I'll get to those a bit later, the remarkable execution wouldn't have been possible without the dedicated efforts of all of the artisans and creators who contributed to the show. I'm echoing my sentiments from season one, but I still find the appearance of the downstairs staff to be quite well put together without any noticeable flaws. Even the background players seemed well attired from what I remember, and while I can't confirm the ratio of costumes made from scratch versus rented or purchased, it's worth noting that many of the background players' costumes were handcrafted by Siam Costumes. Additionally, the men were impeccably dressed, a detail that often goes unmentioned. Curiously, well-tailored men's costumes can be more challenging than women's. As I discussed in my Season 1 video, Julian Fellows aimed for a more muted look for the men's costumes to let the women's outfits stand out. Whether it was day or night, George Russell consistently dressed sharply, while Oscar added flair to his attire with colorful waistcoats, stylish hats, and sunglasses. Witnessing the show's take on the dandy Oscar Wilde was also a real treat. All of the accessories, such as the hats, parasols, walking sticks, jewelry, tiaras, clutches, fans, gloves, and shoes were stunning. And even though uh, it isn't my usual focus, I couldn't help but appreciate the excellence in the hair, wigs, and makeup. The costumes didn't strictly adhere to authenticity, with some silhouettes leaning toward the latter part of the century, and there was a bit of controversy surrounding the possible use of zippers. Additionally, many of the fabrics used were modern and at times looked synthetic. Again, we were in a global pandemic when sourcing and purchasing fabric was a challenge. 
Despite these failings, it was incredibly enjoyable to witness the vibrant costumes come to life, drawing clear inspiration from existing garment examples, most notably French couturier's The House of Worth, along with 19th century paintings, fashion plates, and photos from the era. As an overall observation, there were moments when I was genuinely amazed at the sheer number of costumes featured. Bertha, for example, seldom repeated outfits, showcasing a new ensemble with each scene change. According to the Vanderbilt Mansion National Historic Site, both men and women were expected to change clothing as many times per day as their social status and wealth would allow. It was common for the wealthy to have different clothing for the morning, afternoon, and evening. Drawing insights from Cassia and Eric's Instagram pages, it's evident that principal characters like Bertha, Gladys, Marion, Peggy, Enid, Ada, and Agnes were dressed in custom-made gowns, the majority of which were created specifically for Season 2. While I did notice some recurring outfits from Season 1 on Ada, Agnes, and Marion, Bertha and Gladys boasted an array of brand new gowns in Season 2. I don't know what it is about Bertha, but I have mixed feelings about some of her costumes this season. It's not to say that the silhouette or color palette is not historically accurate, or that it doesn't work for the character because I think as the new guard it does. Because there is this high turnover of Bertha's clothes, we couldn't spend too much time with any outfit. It wasn't until I was making this video that I was like, oh yeah, that outfit. It's impossible to go through all of her looks because there are so many. She had a tremendous amount of day looks. Most of these I thought looked great, with the odd exception. The ones that I preferred the most were the simple ones, in particular the white sheer satin striped day dress with ruffles, which I thought looked so fresh and elegant. However, one gown that I was particularly fond of was a yellow gown with black silk flower shoulder accents that Bertha wears when hosting a dinner for key opera patrons. This gown drew inspiration from an evening dress by the House of Worth from about 1900 to 1905. However, the design team modified the design into a two-piece ensemble that incorporated a bustle. I also really liked the black and white outfit she wears giving a tour of the new Metropolitan Opera House. While it is a different era, it kind of reminds me of the black and white ascot costumes from My Fair Lady. I adored Bertha's teal blue dressing gown that she wears in this loving scene with George, a rare opportunity for us to see Bertha's softer side. And speaking of that, I'd love to see more nightgowns and dressing gowns in future seasons. They were always a plenty in Downton Abbey. Bertha's gowns for some crucial moments during the season left me underwhelmed. Take the scrollwork patterns on the royal blue and white gown and the seafoam gown they were screen printed for the show. Others have noted that the historical House of Worth examples used voided black velvet scrolls on an ivory satin ground, making the show's screen printed fabric appear as a cheap reproduction. This difference was even more evident as Bertha wore a matching seafoam cover up. As I mentioned in my season one review, they did play into the ugly duckling turned into a swan trope for Gladys who burst out of the china doll-like fashion she wore in season one into a more sophisticated silhouette and updo hairstyle. Of course, the poor girl has absolutely no agency as her mother continues to dress her using her as a bargaining chip to advance her own position in society. With a palette of blue, pink, and mauve, I liked all of her costumes this season. The lace placement on her blue Easter Sunday ensemble possibly takes inspiration from the Franz Hohenberger Portrait of a Lady in a Blue Dress with Violets from 1888. And her dark pink hat worn to the tennis event brought to mind this Renoir painting from 1883. One comment that I have on her lilac opera gown is that I would have preferred a mantle instead of this odd cover-up with the heavy use of tulle. There is already an enormous amount of tulle in her gown, including the ruffle sleeves and this caterpillar-like bustle train, so it comes off heavy-handed in my opinion. Now one quibble that I had with Gladys is that there's a scene when she's getting dressed where she isn't wearing a chemise under her corset. In a behind-the-scenes picture taken from Nicole Brydenbloom's Instagram account, instead of a chemise, she's wearing a modern undershirt, 
so at least her corset wasn't sitting directly against her skin on what appeared to be a very hot day. Among my favorite costumes in season two, I particularly admired the understated and sophisticated outfits worn by Enid Winterton. During my appearance on Tony Teflon TV, we discussed the backstory that Turner's previous mistress hailed from the esteemed old money circles of New York. This background likely taught Enid how to emulate the timeless style of the old guard. Marrying into the elite echelons of society, Enid's fashion choices reflect a subtlety characterized by muted tones and a conservative silhouette. It appears that her attire serves as a clever disguise, concealing her plotting and scheming beneath an elegant facade. One of my favorite ensembles she wears in season two is a mauve moiré silk daydress, adorned with creamy lace accents and complemented by a cream straw hat. This charming outfit is notably worn during her visit to Bertha's residence, complete with a matching capelette. Another standout costume that caught my attention is the pink champagne floral gown featuring a delicate pleated collar. I suppose you might call it her sabotage gown. The designer revealed on her Instagram that she drew inspiration from this fashion plate. Interestingly, Kelly Curran, the actress portraying Enid, has expressed her fondness of this blush pink outfit, with a team referring to it as the Jackie O dress. Although I can't distinctly recall it from the show, it is undeniably lovely. Of the old guard, I admire Aurora Fane's costumes. Like Enid, her fashion choices are always elegant with a soft muted color palette. They're lighter compared to Mrs. Astor's rich and heavy brocades. Carrie Astor, on the other hand, is all about the latest trends. Take, for instance, her red and blue floral Easter Sunday outfit, a likely nod to French fashion plates and a recurring theme in her season one looks. I missed her this season and hope to see more of her in season three. Ada and Agnes returned in season two, beginning in the same place costume-wise and firmly rooted in the old guard. Breaking away from their usual jewel tone or earthy palette, the occasion being Easter Sunday, they both opt for fresh pastel hue dresses. Ada graces the scene in a charming mint green gown, while Agnes is dressed in a powder blue ensemble each accompanied by matching parasols. Notably, the pattern on Agnes's dress draws inspiration from the 1785 painting Portrait of Mrs. Sarah Siddons by Thomas Gainsborough. After the Easter Sunday event, Agnes returns to her signature jewel tone palette of green, blue, and purple, a throwback to her wardrobe from the previous season. One standout gown that caught my eye was this beautiful blue satin and brocade ensemble drawing inspiration from an evening dress circa 1885 from Augusta Auction. Another noteworthy creation is Agnes's gown that she wears to the Academy of Music, taking cues from this House of Worth gown from 1888 from the Met. Now, despite my usual admiration for Agnes's costumes, it didn't quite resonate with me. The gown in my eyes falls short due to its apparent fit issues and rush details, such as the somewhat hurriedly executed cap sleeves. In contrast, Ada undergoes one of the most significant costume transformations in the show. Following Easter, she transitions back to her earth tone palette. In particular, she wears a rusty red and yellow gold dress when meeting Luke in the park, a costume she had worn previously in Season 1. Introducing a new gown for Season 2, Ada showcases an almost exact reproduction of this American chrysanthemum day dress created by Martha J. De La Mater from around 1876 from the Fenimore Art Museum. As the plot thickens, Ada's character takes a bold turn. Behind Agnes's back, she embraces a more daring style exemplified by this royal blue ensemble worn during a secret rendezvous with Luke at the art gallery. This striking outfit draws inspiration from an American day ensemble from the Met dating between 1885 to 88. At the garden party, Agnes opts for an elegant emerald silk gown adorned with a feather motif, while Ada radiates youthful charm in a fresh and delightful garden party dress. What pleased me was Ada's choice on her wedding day, a teal blue dress adorned with floral ribbon accents because not all brides wore white during this era. An example of a wedding gown with a long veil, reminiscent of Ada's choice, can be found in the work of American dressmaker Ellen Curtis 
circa 1879. Post-honeymoon, Ada reappears in a striking dark pink ensemble, symbolizing the blossomed love between her and Luke. They dance in their living room, with Ada donning a lovely aqua floral day dress. However, true to Julian Fellow's storytelling style, this happiness is short-lived. Soon, Ada reverts to her earthier tones during Luke's illness, and she enters a period of mourning upon his death, clad in black attire. Now let's talk about Marion's character. Despite being the show's ingenue and the link between the old and the new, I find her the least interesting among the elite characters. Since season one, her wardrobe mainly sticks to blue, green, and yellow, but my main gripe is how often she wears yellow. In the beginning, the yellow worked, in my opinion, but as her character grows, it would be nice to see her try different colors. Also, the more acidic yellow, like the one she wore at the Metropolitan Opera, doesn't go well with her blonde wig. My colleague Tatiana mentioned in a recent live stream that if Marion had brown hair, like actress Louisa Jacobson, the yellow might work better. And like Gladys, I would have preferred to have seen another option aside from this matching cover-up. Among her various fashion choices, I found the darker blue outfits to be the most flattering on her. One costume that stood out was the navy blue tartan day dress with daisy trim that she wore when the rather disagreeable Dashiell Montgomery proposed marriage. However, a refreshing change occurred early in season one when she wore a white eyelet dress with a contrasting red hat with flowers during a weekend in Newport. One of my absolute favorite dresses in her collection is the midnight blue floral gown, a reproduction of the one worn by Frances Folsom Cleveland, the First Lady of the United States, circa 1886. While it's a repeat from season one, it's simply a beautiful gown, making it a welcome sight in season two. After the heart-wrenching saga involving Peggy Scott's son, who was adopted without her knowledge and later passed away, she embarks on two significant storylines in season two. Consequently, Peggy undergoes a wardrobe change, featuring numerous new costumes. In her first storyline, while accompanying her editor, T. Thomas Fortune, to cover a dormitory opening at a black school in Tuskegee, Alabama, she opts for lighter and more practical cotton fabrics, leaving behind the heavier silks and brocades. In the second storyline, Peggy investigates the New York Education Board closing the black schools. During this phase, she reverts to donning her New York Society costumes, with the costume design team drawing inspiration from photos of black elites from that era. Peggy typically adheres to a more conservative color palette, but she occasionally adds a pop of color to provide a hint of contrast. A notable outfit for Peggy is her charming light pink silk and tulle party dress, adorned with a monarch butterfly screen print on the skirt, which she wears to the rooftop party. The inspiration for this costume is likely drawn from the 1898 butterfly ball gown by the House of Worth from the Met. While there may be no direct link, I also happened upon a Princess Margaret birthday party dress designed by Jane Petrie for the show The Crown. However, like the old guard, there were a few repeats, like her soft pink silk dress with brown flowers that she wears in the season finale when she quits her job at the New York Globe. Two new characters are introduced in season two, with the first being Susan Blaine, a wealthy widow who hires Larry Russell to renovate her Newport home, leading to a swift affair. I admired all of Susan Blaine's costumes. As I mentioned this movie musical earlier, Susan kind of reminded me of Audrey Hepburn from My Fair Lady. One of her standout outfits was a silver and black day look with yellow accents, which I found to be a well-put-together ensemble. But in my opinion, the standout costumes in season two belong to Maude Beaton, a con artist and faux heiress reported to be the illegitimate daughter of Jay Gould, a rumor that Maude likely initiated herself. Nicole Bryden-Bloom effortlessly shines in all of her costumes, making her the season's wardrobe MVP. To unravel the mystery of how Maude manages such an impressive collection of outfits, we can draw parallels to Canadian grifter Cassie Chadwick, likely the inspiration for Maude's character. Like the fraudster she's based upon, Maude probably acquired the most recent Paris fashions by forging a series of checks to bring about a successful ruse. Among Maude's wardrobe choices, one of my favorites was her bubblegum pink garden dress adorned with white lace accents. 
and if I have to nitpick from her stunning collection, my only reservation lies with her baby pink gown featuring blue-gray accents, inspired by Alfred Stevens' Painting Before the Ball from the period between 1880 and 85. While the design is lovely and complements her beautifully, I can't help but notice that the fit and construction of the gown fall short compared to her other dresses. Let me know in the comments section your favorite costume from Season 2. As the Gilded Age has been renewed for a third season, I look forward to seeing what's in store for our characters. If you enjoyed this breakdown and want to see more of this type of content, consider subscribing to my channel so that you will get a reminder when I have a new video. And in the meantime, you can check out our end of season roundup of the Gilded Age. Thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video.